And I really believe that God is going to plant us in a way in this season where we can receive what would normally take years to grow into or what would take tons of process, what would take a lot of time for a setup that God's divinely setting us up or even bypassing that process because he wants a result that he knows we don't have time to wait for in our generation. Welcome to my show, The Sean Bull Show, where we look at current events, world news, and culture from a biblical and conservative lens. And today on the show, we have a great show. We're going to start off with part two of one of my favorite segments we've ever done. It was all about Christian comedians who are on social media or stand-ups. And I think you need to know some of these people right now. I want to hear what you think as I react to them. I want to hear your reaction. So make sure to put it in the comments below or tell us, email us, you know, at bullsministries.com. You could email us. Then I want to show you a new college professor. He's not really a new college professor, but he's new to us named Warren Smith and how he's getting in trouble with liberals for teaching people how to think critically in his new college. And J.K. Rowling of the Harry Potter books and Harry Potter fame is somehow in the middle of the controversy with him. I'm also gonna to talk to Raj Nair. You may have heard of Raj, you may not have heard of Raj, but he's led hundreds of trips with I think over a thousand influencers from around the world to Israel. And I wanna hear his current take on what's happening right now in the war because he has one that's really profound and he's helped a lot of people to have a connection to Israel through the last decade. Finally, I have a prophetic perspective for you and it's all about the suddenlies and instantlies of God that I believe we're coming into right now as believers. This show is brought to you by Birch Gold and this is an election year and it's slamming economic stability. And it's a great time to diversify in the only currency that we know has been extremely safe for generations, which is gold. You can invest a portion of your IRA or 401k in a way that really safeguards the investment. And the community of the investors really believe in safeguarding with gold, with commodities. And our friends at Birch Gold have put together a free information kit that will at least give you the currency to simplify the process. So go to birchgold.com forward slash Sean Bowles, B-O-L-Z, S-H-A-W-M-B-O-L-Z, today to get yours. And we've had many people who have been listening to the show get involved with Birch Gold, and they've just given us incredible testimonies. So I hope you'll do it too, especially in 2024, because the instability economically is something that we want to prepare for even more right now than ever before. Well, I have our first story today, and I just love this story. I love doing these stories. I love when the team has me react to things like this, because there's a lot of comedians. Now, for many, many generations, comedians have been a little cringy when it comes to Christianity. And then something happened. There's a couple people who I think we're featuring one of them today who kind of broke out of that old mode mold and said, you know, I think we don't have to do the weird stuff. We don't have to do the shenanigans of comedy and Christianity, but we can actually have real discussion and say real things through comedy that gets a laugh, but also helps people in their heart. And I just love laughter. I think joy is one of the most important things we can have in our life. The joy of the Lord is our strength. So we're gonna start out with Leland Klassen. This is Canada's premier clean comedian who also happens to be a believer. This is a, a, a true story. I was, well, it's all true. This is just more true. It's just more. <laughs> I was crossing the border just a couple years ago now. I got to the border, I handed the guy my passport. He took it, he scanned it through the machine. First thing he said after he scanned it through the machine, don't make any sudden movements, right? So I was like, Okay, and then he's like, shut up for a vehicle and give me the keys too. But then he said to me, in a couple of moments, I'm gonna ask you to get out of the car. And when you do, if you make any sudden movements at all, we're gonna take you to the ground. That's what he said verbatim. Those, and the reason he said a couple of moments too, because he had time for his armed buddies to come out and surround the car. I'm not gonna make up the number for the story either. By the, by the time I got out, there were, there were six of them surrounding the car. They never guns drawn, but their hands on their guns, you know, on their hips and ready to... Ready to shoot a Canadian mode? <laughs> you know, waiting to bag me a Canuck all week. Here we go. <laughs> but I was freaked out. I was scared. I just went to the back of the car. They actually shoved me down on the hood in the back. Like my face was squished on the hood in the back of the car. Right? Well, <laughs> it's the hood's not in the back of the car. Is it? I drive a Porsche, so <laughs> comedy has been good to me. So they got me pinned down, they handcuffed me behind my back, they grabbed me with the armed guard, and they take me into the customs office like I was some kind of wanted fugitive or something, right? So they're taking me into the customs office, and again, absolutely true story, I was in there for like, I don't know, like maybe five seconds, like not long at all, and some guard walks all nonchalantly from behind the counter, and he's like, oh, I guess there's a computer malfunction, you can just let him go. Oh my gosh, he's picking his teeth. There's no explanation, no apology. No place to go change, nothing. Uh, well, some of that fruit goes through you pretty fast, am I right? 
I won't say what it is doing. It's not super bad. Where it belongs. <laughs> He's sweet. I, I, I mean, hey, Canada. We have a lot of Canadians who watch this. We're in the top 50 commentary uh, shows in, in podcasting in Canada. He's a sweet guy. You guys got some good comedians there. But I wanted to tell you that we do have a spiritual growth academy to help push you forward in this growth. And this month's class is all about hearing God for deliverance. And so if you have something you need to get over that's spiritually rooted or you want to help others to get free, we have a theologian named Mark Verkler who is just one of the best guys, just a spiritual father. He's right up your alley if you love this stuff. He's going to give you a real foundation. There's a couple of live classes left. You can catch up with the pre-recorded classes and get into live classes. And it'll start you out with a fresh just or a refresh in your journey for deliverance. But I'm also leading a April's class. You can sign up now. And it's a four week class on how to develop your platform and influence and become a voice. So, so many people ask us because I have one of the top or two of the top podcasts in Christianity. I've had a ministry platform for a long time. I'm on TV and a lot of Christian media. They ask, how did you know how to pursue your platform and your place of influence? And how did you do that in a way that has a kingdom foundation to it? And so we're going to be doing a class on that. So you're going to have a biblical worldview, even on how to build influence. It's such a good class. Four live classes, four hours of pre-recorded classes, plus a lot of worksheets. There's assessments, a prophetic assessment. There's an assessment for knowing which platform you should go after. And you want to start with us. You want to start this because it's going to challenge you. If you're going to write a book or create a podcast, launch a business commission, a ministry, whatever you're going to do, it's going to help you so much. But let's get back into this. But if you want Spiritual Growth Academy, make sure to visit Spiritual Growth Academy by going to bowlsministries.com and clicking on Academy. Well, here we go. We have Hillary and she, uh, Caitlin, and she has Hills of Hope on Instagram, but she also has some other uh, social medias as well. But the first one we're going to watch, I believe, is Sharice the Pig. And this is not the one I posted. This is a different one. So I can't wait to see it. Did I ever tell you about the time I almost got in a fight with the prodigal son? <laughs> Girl, yes. I was up in the pen, right? Minding my business, eating my delicious dinner. Mm, it was so good. And girl, tell me why in the middle of eating, I look up and I see this scraggly ragamuffin man looking at me crazy. You know, I was looking at him. He looking at me. And it felt uncomfortable. So I was like, well, I'm going to just <laughs> proceed. I look away, you know, trying to mind my business. Mm -hmm. This is weird. <laughs> and girl, before you know it, tell me why this whole human was diving for my food. Yes, girl. Like, that's another level of famished, right? He was clearly so hungry. No, I didn't give him no food. What you think this is? <laughs> you know, I'm not that saved. But I did I did hold off on giving him a bacon beat down. I was ready. <laughs> <laughs> she's so cute. So Sharice the Pig is, takes one of the iPhone filters, and she's done uh, not only the prodigal son story, she's done a bunch of the stories in the Bible, like the, the pigs that get killed because the demoniac goes in, or the demons from the demoniac go into them, and she was the one that was saved. It's so funny. So she also has other stories and other things as well. I'm going to watch, I think there's one more of her, so I'm going to watch hers as well. I brought him to my mother's house, to the chamber of the one who conceived me. <gasps> Scandalous. Sis in your mama room? Okay. His cheeks are like beds of spice. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> Brother, fine. I'm going to need a and highlighter. <laughs> uh, Lord, I would like a husband who has cheeks that are like beds of spice. <laughs> Ooh, his lips are like lilies. We're going to highlight that too, okay? His arms are rods of gold set with burl. Mm. We're going to highlight that too. Yes, Lord. <laughs> I receive it in Jesus' name. Yes, Lord. I mean, that was part three of a series where she's reading about uh, Song of Solomon in the Bible. I mean, it's amazing. The, you got to follow her. Just go there, Hills of Hope. Someone who's no stranger to Christian comedy and who's been around forever is someone I've seen live several times. It's Tim Hawkins. And Tim, uh, he's just, uh, this guy is so funny. And he just, he, he skirts on the edge of inappropriate so well, where it's like he stays on the right side of that line. But he's just funny. And one of the things that he did recently, and I think this is the clip that I actually picked for this, which was when he talks about words that should be Christian cuss words. And he asked his audience to say, what are words that should be Christian cuss words? I believe that's a clip we have. So let's play this. Some of you are going with me and some of you aren't going with me on this one yet. Trust me, some Christian alternative cuss words that we could use when we needed them and everything would be okay because we knew it had the holy stamp of approval. So a while back, I put out a Facebook post asking people for ideas of Christian cuss words. I got over uh, 10,000 responses from you freaks. 
Now, none of these is for me. You can't put it on me. Over 10,000 from you bozos. It took me two weeks to go through them, and I, and I whittled it down to about 100 or so Christian alternative cuss words that you could use. I haven't memorized it yet, but I'd like to recite it for you right now. So Christians, just oh take God. these and uh, cuss up a storm. <laughs> Listen up. Here we go. Shucks, rats, gadzooks, shizzle, toot. Crapola, which I guess is Spanish for crap. I don't know. Crapola, you almost stepped in crapola. <laughs> or it's the worst crayon color ever. <laughs> hey, who's got the crapola over here? I'm trying to draw a tree trunk. I need to stop taking my crapola. Holy moly, holy stinking moly, holy guacamole, holy mackle, holy cow, holy smokes, holy buckets, bucket head, turd. <laughs> you like turd, don't you, sir? You're going to be using you some turd. <laughs> fiddle sticks, fiddle faddle flipping. Horse hockey, horse pucky. Horse feathers, horse patootie. Fooey, bull twinkie, shut the front door. I can relate to this. My parents are so funny because they were not into alternative cuss words or expressions. So we would say things like, that's freaking, they say, don't say freaking or whatever it was. You know, they just don't say this because you're basically saying the real cuss word. I'm like, no, if I was saying the real cuss word, I'd be saying the real cuss word. So I like where he goes with this. It goes on and on. He tells, if this is your jam, you're going to like it. If it's not your jam, again, sometimes you'll listen to a comedian. Like I've listened to someone my sister loves, my sister loves comedy. And we'll sit down together and she's dying. And I'm like, eh. And then other times we're watching something that I love and she's like, eh. So every comedian is going to give a different reaction to the different people, except for some of our favorite comedians that um, are out there in the mainstream. And I'm like loving that. One of those is Angela Johnson. I feel like you can almost never miss with Angela Johnson. She's a Christian. She has some great clips that are out there. We're going to play one of those clips right now. I love Angela and her husband. They've been friends for years. Let's play this clip. In Los Angeles, if I go to a store and they're like, can I help you find anything? I'm like, I'm okay. And if I'm feeling really friendly that day, I'm like, I'm okay, thanks. <laughs> That's it. That's where it ends. <laughs> then I got to Nashville. <laughs> I'm at TJ Maxx one day. That's I can day. hear the ladies in the row next to me. Can I help you find anything? I'm all right, but thank you so much for asking. <laughs> it's my pleasure. It's a beautiful day outside. Yes, it is, but they say it's gonna rain about three o'clock. Make sure you get home before the traffic. It's gonna be a mess. Bless your heart. I was like, ooh, I don't know if I have energy for the South. <laughs> Exactly. I don't know how to do it. Like, who stops talking first? Well, I don't know if you heard this in your social media world or in the news, but there's a college professor named Warren Smith who began to challenge some philosophy that students had or biases students had because a lot of students are just programmed and go with herd mentality and they don't do critical thinking. And so Warren Smith, uh, there's a video released him by, I think, a student, and then maybe he re-released it, of... Uh, a student who was arguing with them over whether or not J.K. Rowling was a transphobic individual who should be canceled. And he was like, why do you think that that would be? Why do you think that she, what, give me the reason behind that. So we're gonna play a clip, we're gonna see this. So these guys wanna talk about J.K. Rowling? Is, is that, so what's going on with that? What do you wanna know? She's she's had a pretty controversial past. I just wanna know like, what are your thoughts on it? Like, do you still like her work despite her uh bigoted opinions. So let's get specific though. Let's define bigoted opinions. What opinions are bigoted? We're going to treat this as a thought experiment. I'm not going to say yeah. what's right or wrong or what way to think. The whole point is to learn how to think, not what to think. Yeah. yeah. So when you say bigoted, you, you're, you're starting with the conclusion that given her bigoted opinions. Yeah. So first her, uh, let's start with does she have bigoted opinions? So when you, when you say bigoted opinions. She has had a history of being extremely transphobic, I've heard. And you've heard. So what? can you give me an example? I love that because most teachers are like, yeah, you're right. You know, most of the liberal colleges, and they just go on with the narrative. And what he's saying is, okay, let's think for yourself. You, you've heard. What have you seen? What are you responding to, reacting to? Are you reacting to 
news media or gossip or slander? Or is there something you can show me on her own tweets or her own communications that, that prove this? Again, this should be 101. And it's not 101, it's 0% 101. Most people, when you ask them, why do you think transgenderism should be fought for so much? They don't have original thinking. They have like a lot of echoes, a lot of repeats of what they think is true, but they're not sure. And they're trying not to get in trouble because they have some confusion around it as well. And so I love that he's teaching critical thinking. Again, th when you teach critical thinking in these colleges, they, not maybe not the colleges themselves, but there's a whole group, a mass out there that once you canceled, and I think this is really profound. Uh... If you look at her Twitter, I think um, you could see a few things. Um, if you want, I could try and find yeah, see something. If you can find, see if you can find one. So, one of these tweets that she came up with in 2019, she said, Dress however you please, call yourself whatever you like, sleep with any consenting adult who will have you, um, live your best life in peace and security, but force women out of their jobs for starting that for stating that sex is real. So you find that bigoted? What do you find about it? It was, it was deemed transphobic. I, like, I myself. In 2019, she got in trouble for that statement and the version of community notes that existed then actually called it transphobic. And the transphobic or the trans community also called it transphobic because she was addressing what, uh, men running in sports or gender men who are identified as women running in sports and taking roles that women have spent and fought their whole lives to get. And we're finally getting ahead of, with a lot of women's rights. And J.K. Rowling really cares about women's rights. Now, whether you like her or not, she, it's one of the platforms. She's she's been, become a billionaire and given the majority of her money back to fight for women empowerment and will not fight for trans empowerment. And that's what's causing an issue here. And so I like that he asked the question, what's bigoted about this? Do you find that transphobic yourself? Uh, I don't really have an opinion on it, but I'm just going with what a lot of other people. Have. I don't have an opinion, but I'm going with what other people are saying. This is the condition of the younger generation of America. Said so let's pause it. Let's not go with what other people are saying. Let's try and Thank you. learn how to critically think. So let's analyze the tweet ourselves. So that statement, do you see anything problematic disregarding other people's opinions? Um, she did. That's a really scary question for a young person right now, and even for, for anybody, because if you're being asked in a public stage, this is a classroom, do you find it bigoted? And there's people that are like, J.K. Rowling is evil, and she's she's part of the persecution, excuse me, she's part of the persecution against what I believe in. And then you, you just take a stand, and you really don't know how much you want to stand for or against this. It's a huge deal. Try and pin some things on a, spe a specific group of per of people. Where does she, where does she do, that, do that? Can you read that? But force women out of their jobs for stating that sex is real. So when I hear that, I'm interpreting that as meaning if a woman says that, you know, saying that there is a difference between men and female and then being attacked as transphobic, I think that's what she's saying by it. attacking someone for stating that sex is real. That is exactly what she is saying. Is that I, transphobic to you? So, to me, no. Stating that sex is real is not transphobic. It's just a fact of life. It exists. So is there anything you disagree with in that tweet? In that tweet, I can't really see anything that I myself disagree with, but I can see why some people would think, oh, this is offensive. We can't have that here or something, because... Sure. Uh, there's an apology tweet. Um, she, let's read that. What did she say there? I haven't read that. I respect every trans person's right to live any way that feels authentic and comfortable to them. I'd march with you if you were discriminated against on the basis of being trans. At the same time, my life has been shaped by being female. I do not believe it is hateful to say so. You see anything problematic there? She's apologizing, so... No, not really. Um, if I if I could read it. Again. So she's she's acknowledging, and I've followed this for a while. J.K. Rowling acknowledges, in her mind, in her philosophy of life, and she claims to be a Christian, that trans people can have the right to be trans, and that we shouldn't challenge that for them. But that doesn't mean that their gender is actually a female. They are a hybrid. They are a choice, not um, not what other people would say, where it's like this is her true identity, or they, they can be, you know whatever you choose in your pronouns and your gender is 
what it is. And so she wouldn't believe in that because that fights against her femininity of the femaleness. And she's, she's dying on that hill. I mean, she's going for it on that hill. She's not back down. She's like, I am an advocate for all people to have the expression of the freedom that they want to have, but it can't take away my freedom. And she stated that over and over and over. It can't take away women's rights and freedom. And this has been, again, it's one of the trans communities hills that they're trying to die on as well. On the other side, it can. It sounds like a, the same, a very similar statement as what she was just saying. She's basically saying, like, I have nothing to me. This is what I interpret it as. I have nothing against someone being trans. Exactly. It's your life, but you just don't get to impose on my. You can live how you want. I can live how I want. Yeah. And let's all, you know. Exactly. Do you think it's fair that there's a that she's being attacked by a large group of people and people are calling her? Like you said at the beginning of this conversation, you said, given the fact that J.K. Rowling is transphobic, how do you feel about Harry Potter? Now, yeah. retroactively looking at that statement, do you think that that was the best way to phrase? No, I feel like an idiot now. <laughs> so what happened with this video is it went viral and people called him a brainwasher. People said that he's not teaching critical thinking, he's actually teaching people to side with J.K. Rowling's point of view and that he's actually not teaching the right kind of biases, basically. They're saying he's teaching biases, but he's not really teaching their biases. So they're upset with it. And so, again, they're, he's trying to teach this young man to think for himself. And this is what he does a lot in his classes. And the trans community came against him. And then a lot of progressive left liberals came against him. And they were tagging him on Twitter with his school and trying to get him fired. And he, his school had thousands, not hundreds thousands of calls to try and get him fired. And there's even a boycott, a uh, signed petition from people who weren't in the school, people who are not attending the school, the people who are attending the school are not coming against them, who were trying to boycott or get him canceled or fired or whatever it is. I just wanted to bring this to your attention. This young man is amazing. I've watched a lot of his videos and the way he teaches and people to think for themselves, the way he teaches freedom of speech. And now it looks like he's been having a God awakening on top of that. To, and even some conservative values have been coming and expressed through, which I hadn't heard when he first started a few months ago. Something's happened as far as an awakening, in my opinion. So I would encourage you to watch him and I'd encourage you to stay engaged in the conversation. And if you have a channel that you're trying to start to don't get discouraged if you get suppressed or if some, some bad shenanigans happen, but trust God and, and ask God for strategies around it. Ask God to grow you the way you're supposed to grow. And I'm not saying everybody who thinks you're shadow banned is shadow banned, but Warren Smith started to challenge these students and the clip went viral. And then he got almost shadow banned or canceled or these bot, you know, bot attacks. And I think, you know, he, he creating the right kind of thinking, God will give him a platform and the controversy is going to just die down. People will forget about who he is and he'll kind of reemerge or he'll have an even deeper voice in the society. And we'll want to hear even more from him. And I love that there, that we can watch these things happen in real time, that people are being this vulnerable and exposing this much. With all that's going on in Israel right now, it's amazing to me that so many people in America have been to Israel and have been impacted by it. There's several million people go each year and have an experience with what I think is a biblical encounter by going to Israel. And you have believers make the pilgrimage, both Jewish believers, but also Christian believers from around the world to Israel up until this terrible October 7th date when a war started because of extreme terrorism from the Gaza Strip, from the Palestinians who are extremists or have been radicalized. And this has been so devastating to watch. There's been challenges currently where even people are trying to get a ceasefire, but it's not a ceasefire that's a fair ceasefire because there's still so many hostages. Many of the women hostages were killed because the extremists didn't want their testimonies to be heard on the World Forum. And before this all happened, I have a friend named Raj Nair who took, uh, for I think over 10 years, took hundreds of influencers to Israel to give them an experience. So these are Instagram influencers and, and YouTube influencers and people who are young pastors and people who needed to see what Israel is like. He wanted to give them, with the organization he was with, an encounter with Israel. And I think this was no small thing to happen before a war like this because in the, the, the court of popular opinion, you see all kinds of people who are saying, we have to free Palestine. Well. We tried to free Palestine many times, and that's a whole other conversation. But we had all these influencers who were like, you don't understand. I love Israel. Like, I've been there. Like, my feet were on the ground. I had an encounter there. It was very special. It's a very special place. And it created a different narrative in a lot of the social media arenas because they took the time to go, because Raj took the time to invite them and have an experience with them. Well, Raj is going to be sharing with us not only what he did then, but what he thinks is happening in Israel today. Because right now, we need to be as informed as we can to pray and to be able to stand with Israel. So up next is Raj Nair. 
Raj, you have been on the ground in Israel more times than most of my friends, even some of my Jewish friends. You've gone there and you brought influencers from all over the world, especially like Instagram influencers, TikTok influencers, people like this, and young pastors. And all these types of people have gone with you right before the war broke out, and which I think made a big difference. I think you made a huge impact on even people's awareness because there's so many people when it came to anti-Israel or like pro-Palestinian that there's all these influencers like, I was there. Wait, it's not what you're saying it is. They had firsthand accounts. And we're talking about like dozens, if not hundreds. I want to hear about this. Yes. Well, you know, I, I think what's important to contextualize for Israel is that it's really hard to put it in a sentence, right? Mm -hmm. This is the best way I've had it described to me where it's like, hey, you've been to Israel, me personally, you've led 30 trips or something in the past decade. Explain it quickly. It's like, okay, well, let me give you an analogy. Uh, you live in America, right? All right. Explain race relations. You know, it, it, wow. it's, yeah. it, it's not, you can't tweet this out. And so the heart of what we did at Israel Collective was give people context because you can't distill this as, as, as tempting as it might be to distill this into one or two sound bites. And the, re the reason I initially got into the Israel space was geopolitical, right? You know, mm -hmm. it's the one democracy in the Middle East. It's the one place in the Middle East where women have equal rights. The Christian population is growing, blah, 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 blah. Then something happened where I cracked open the Bible and I was like, wait, time out. <laughs> wait, time out. What is God doing right now? You know, I was born in the 80s. So I've always lived in a world where there was a reborn state of Israel. But for thousands of years, hundreds of years, that wasn't the case. And, and if you actually kind of switch your your lens and you start seeing, wait, wait, God said what in Ezekiel and in Jeremiah and in Deuteronomy and in Zechariah? And you just go down the list and you start seeing, wait a second, hold on, time out. We are living in the fulfillment of the most absurd God miracle that even in God said trumps what he did in the Exodus in Jeremiah 16. There is something happening here. And so it's, now when I used to lead these trips, we obviously, we, we really used to get in the geopolitics. We go to the border of Gaza, the border of Lebanon, the border of Syria, heart of the West Bank, talk about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, and all that stuff is super important. But I think the thing that is the differentiator of seeing this conflict in a not just a God perspective, but in a holistic perspective is yeah. there is something happening here that is absurd and preposterous and miraculous and beautiful. And if you don't start with what God is doing there, then you're missing the whole ballgame. So what we used to do was very comprehensive, but my heart was, let's start with scripture. And I think that's what I've also realized le leading a bunch of these trips of Christian influencers. I hate that term, but man, you, a lot of these Christian influencers don't know their Bible. And so yeah. to me, my, my heart's cry by the end of this thing was if I can get people to fall in love with scripture, all of it, right? Not just the warm, fuzzy parts in Psalms and John, but the weird stuff, then you can create people that see this conflict for what it is. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll show you, share with you one quick story. You know, I was at this uh, Jewish donor event in, in, in New York city, right on, on, on uh, in central park. And uh, Let's just say these people could write a lot of zeros on checks. And this this one guy who I, I'll, I'll remain nameless, not for any reason, but he had this, this Christian guy. He had this presentation, and he said, "Hey, listen, we did a lot of research, and we found this." And he said this to a, a group of Jewish people: "If you want Christians to support Israel, the best thing they can do is fall in love with Jesus." And what he meant by that is the research showed that the more a Christian loves their Bible, almost by definition, the more they will support the modern state of, of Israel. Wow, wow, that's really interesting. Because they'll see what God is doing, yeah. what God is up to, that he's a covenant keeper, that he's a promise keeper, that he's not done with the Jewish people. In you know, Romans 9, 10, 11, 12, no, he has not rejected his people. Now there's complications, right? Like they, you know, they don't accept Jesus as the Messiah. We could talk about all that stuff. And obviously that's the whole ball game, but if uh, you want a Christian, a young Christian to support Israel, 
make them fall in love with their Bible. Raj, you're amazing. I love that you did this for so many years with all these influencers. And I love what you're doing now. Tell people how to get to a hold of your website right now. Yeah, so we have a, a new show, a new show that TBN is producing called Can I Trust the Bible? It's a new YouTube channel. It's on podcasts and all that stuff. We actually have an episode with you. It's already mm-hmm. out. A new episode coming out here soon. Oh, so perfect. yeah, Can I Trust the Bible amazing. YouTube channel is where you can find me. Thanks, Raj, for being on today. Love you, brother. Every week, we like to supplement your Sundays with a prophetic message and a teaching. And this one's no different, but it's one of my favorites because it deals with timing. And I really thought as I was praying to be impressed to talk about the suddenlies of God, the instance of God in the Bible. And I want you to expect, I mean, as a Christian, you have to expect that there's moments in your life where God suddenly shows up or instantaneously brings his value and things move forward. Your culture of life, the things that you're believing for, the things that need to happen, happen. And I really believe that God is going to plant us in a way in this season where we can receive what would normally take years to grow into or what would take tons of process, what would take a lot of time for a setup that God's divinely setting us up or even bypassing that process because he wants a result that he knows we don't have time to wait for in our generation. There's a principle in the Bible that's illustrated so many times through so many lives, and it's the instant and suddenly of God. Things that were one way suddenly were different. Problems were occurring, and because of God's intervention, they stopped. And people waited for a long time, and suddenly the change came. I think God moves in the suddenly all the time. I also think that there's times of waiting, there's times of resting, there's times of wilderness, there's there's seasons to God. I love Ecclesiastes where it talks about that. But when it's time for the sudden things, like I believe for many of you who are watching right now, hashtag if it's you, hashtag my turn. If it's your turn for a suddenly of God, you have to start to trust that he's going to move in a way because you don't want to be like Abraham and Sarah where Sarah's like, well, God promised us, but I'm too old now. And then God, the angel shows up and says, it's going to happen. And she laughs because she doesn't believe in that it could suddenly instantly happen because of the stage of life she's been in. We're going to talk about that in a minute. But God's going to move even when you're not aware. And when you are aware, he's going to move in some ways behind the scenes. And all of a sudden it will happen in your in your vantage point in your viewpoint and you know suddenly you'll get saved or suddenly instantly you're going to get healed or suddenly you're going to have a breakthrough instantly you're going to get delivered suddenly his provision is there instantly you're going to get called of god to do a work because suddenly is how god moves so many times he moves instantly he moves unexpectedly and we see it again all over the bible jesus i love reached out and touched This man, and the man says, I'm willing. And he said, be healed. And instantly the leprosy disappeared, Matthew 8, verse 3. I love another scripture. Suddenly there was a massive earthquake and the prison was shaken to its foundations. All the doors immediately, suddenly flew open and the chains of every prisoner fell off. The jailer woke up to see prison doors wide open and he assumed the prisoners had all escaped. So he drew his sword to kill himself. But Paul shouted to him, stop, don't kill yourself. We're all here. And the jailer called for the lights and ran to the dungeon and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. And then he brought them and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Acts 16, 26 through 30. Suddenly there was an earthquake and instantly those jail doors opened up. And then instantly her bleeding stopped and she felt as if her body was healed from her disease, Mark 5, 29. I love these scriptures. You know, there's so many times where, where we have that instant experience of where we get to see God move. Maybe it was your salvation where suddenly you were saved. You didn't even expect it. Maybe it was a time when God positioned you for a job or a role or something that you got to do and you were the least likely and suddenly God moved. Maybe it was a miracle you've been praying for, something that you prayed for for a long time, but you had your moment of suddenly or instantly or immediately. I think of my wife and I, when we first got married, I had spent all of the money that I had accumulated on building a church during the recession in Los Angeles. And every bit of money that came in for any of the projects I was working on that were outside ministry or were parachurch ministry, I was I was literally getting 50% or more of any money that would come into the church. So I wasn't accumulating anymore. And I'd lost a lot of money in the 2007, 2008 recession. So when I got married to my wife, Cherie, I had to tell her like, hey, I haven't accumulated a lot in a long time. I've just been surrendered to God. I feel like he's asked me to not look at finances and not build right now, but I'm ready to build with you. I feel like it's time to build. And she's like, okay, good. I, I've dreamed of having a house. I believe God wants us to save. And really, but then we looked at our income. And we're like, oh my gosh, our church has a hard time financially at that point. And then also, I wasn't feeling to be the pastor anymore. And so we were looking for a replacement and we didn't know what was next. I thought what was next was going to be, uh, you know, uh, entertainment industry and production. And so during that time, that season, we we're really praying through it. And we had a lot of things happen where it was just, we were waiting more and where finances were even harder. We felt more hard pressed than, than relieved. And I remember at one point, 
I wrote a book and I, I, I had a publisher, but it was like a co-publishing experience. It's called Transcend God. Some of you might've read this book. And I remember the publisher said, okay, for this book to come out, we need, um, I, I don't know if it was 20 or $30,000 for the printing of this book. It's kind of a co-published deal. And I was like, oh my gosh, we don't, we don't have access to that. And I was thinking, I wonder how we could pull from credit, but a credit card limit would be really have to be stretched. And then we'd also have a higher interest rate because of the time and the season it was in. I was like, I can't believe we don't have the money to print this book. And I remember looking at Sri going, what do you think? Like, what are, how we have to print this book. We've made a commitment to this publisher and we're publishing this book in like three weeks. What are we going to do? And she's like, I don't know. And I said, well, let's just pray. And we had peace about saying yes. And we're like, why do we have peace when we don't have the money, when we don't have the ability to do this? And we didn't have an ability to take a loan. We didn't want to talk to a personal friend to do a loan just because we were brand new married and we hadn't accumulated in a long time. And so I remember I had ministered to a random person at the time it was very random to me and um, hadn't thought about him again. And I was checking through, someone had sent me an email and they said, can you check your junk mail for the email? Was this a random business email? Because we sent it to you for sure. Maybe it went into your junk mail. And I, I think it was the second time in my life I checked my junk mail in a real way. And I was combing through my junk mail and I saw the name of a person I had prayed for and had connected to in another country. And I was like, this is so interesting. And I look at the email and I'm like, this can't be true. And Shree was in my room, or we were in our bedroom, and so she was in the room with me, and I was I had my little office set up in a, by her bed because we were just had a small house. And I looked over at her and I go, Babe, I I, I gotta I, I gotta read this to you. And she thought something terrible had happened because my face had whited out. And we'd been waiting. We had now had a couple days left before we had to pay for these books. And that was just one thing that we and we had some areas where we weren't in debt because we were very careful not to go into debt, but we didn't want to go into debt. And we had like some car debt. That was it. And so we were like, oh my gosh, we're just, this is a challenge. You know, it's my wife's pregnant at the time. We were newly married, all these things. And all of a sudden I look up at her and I'm reading this. I said, this is from the organization that he runs that donates to ministries. I said, they found us that we're supposed to have $200,000 right now. They're supposed to gift us for a ministry and for a personal life. God wants to come to bring you a suddenly moment and an instantaneous miracle. And it may not happen in the context of you're right now, but he's allowing you to wait or he's allowing a buildup sometimes of drama so that when it comes, you'll know you couldn't have done it yourself. You couldn't have got yourself here. You couldn't have paid the price for it to come. Jesus paid the price on the cross. Jesus set you up so he could be the one who gets the glory out of the situation. So you can go, only God could have done that. Only God could have brought me here. Only God could have advanced me this way. Only God could have pushed me forward. And some of the things you've been trying to do in your own upper room experience of waiting on God, he wants to come suddenly and bring an answer to these areas. And you don't want to grow weary and waiting because God wants to come in his way. And it's going to be totally different and better than you could have imagined right now. You can't even imagine how God's going to come through. So I want to make sure that you hashtag it's my turn. If this resonates with you, make sure to hashtag my turn and also put the suddenly you need. Tell us what you want us to be in agreement for. And we're going to be praying for you. And I also want to remind you, we want to take a, you know, a digital offering, so to speak, right now, because these videos every Sunday are made because of generous donations from people just like you. And so if you love our content, if you're liking our YouTube, you like our podcast, you like our, our all the things that we do, you like the prophetic that I'm carrying, you like the commentary I'm carrying, make sure to leave a donation at bullsministries.com. We need it right now to move forward. We have several projects that we're trying to move forward in and we're trying to up the quality. So right now you might notice that I'm not in my normal studio because we are in Dallas, Fort Worth area, working with TBN. And so I have a home studio that I make my podcasts and broadcasts from. And so we're getting some of that ready for you for and it's because of generous donations from people just like you that we're able to have the lighting upgrade we've had a camera upgrade from a donor that was so amazing we've had all kinds of things that have come in because of you and it makes all the difference in the world and it helps us to have those margins where we can give to some of the anti-human trafficking projects that we feel that we're supposed to partner to and that we could use our platform for children at risk i think it's so profound when you make that donation you're not just giving to us but you're inheriting from all the things that God's doing through our ministry right now. So go to bullsministries.com, click on that donate button, become a reoccurring partner so we can give back to you and we can speak into your life, pray with you every month and be a part of your journey. Now I have some news you need to know. Well, Gamergate has happened. This is Gamergate 2.0. A woke company that injects DEI and LGBTQ plus politics into games was hired for a new Suicide Squad comic book game, which had a community uproar on Steam, which is one of the platforms 
which is due to its bad storyline that wasn't in line with the comics and featured a political agenda around every corner. An executive from the company who did this, Sweet Baby Incorporated, was shown in a video trying to get a Steam player who was a, has a huge following banned because of his campaign against Sweet Baby Incorporated. The gamer community is raging against him right now as we speak, and even Elon Musk has weighed in because of Sweet Baby tanking games and having bad politics and policies to educate and bring edutainment as opposed to entertainment. Sweet Baby is a story writing company hired to supplement video game studios writing staff. And the idea is a studio can hire them to flesh out the game's script and storyline to make sure it's relevant to current politics of the day. The company is transparent about their goals of approaching writing with a focus on representation and marginalized groups. For a growing number of players, this is a dog whistle for unwanted insertion of political ideologies or other topics they are interested in. In other words, a distraction from what really matters, making a great game. You can easily find examples of these sorts of people on social media. Many releases such as Suicide Squad have had Sweet Baby credit as part of the writing staff, and these games have been a major disappointment for many players. A sweet baby credit is now being thought of like a leprosy and an indicator of games to avoid, and I'd encourage you to do just that. Well, another story, higher education fueling decline in marriage birth rate. A conservative policy expert highlighted the role of higher education as playing in the decline of marriage and total fertility as more people opt to take more time to pursue college degrees, which she warned is extending their adolescence and deferring certain responsibilities. On Wednesday, the Heritage Foundation hosted the event titled The Birth Dearth, Why the Decline in Marriage and Total Fertility is a Genuine Crisis. The demographic crisis in the United States is a real and a threat to society and a threat to society as we know it. The U.S. and almost all developed countries are failing to replace their populations. Ms. Burke referenced an August 2023 Heritage Foundation paper she published on the subject alongside the Center for Education Policy Senior Research Fellow, J.P. Green. During the panel, Burke highlighted a point addressed on the paper, noting that this extension of schooling typically leads to an extended adolescence, which is not healthy. Well, that's all the news you need to know today. I want to encourage you, if you've liked our show, make sure to leave a comment, subscribe, hit notifications. We want to do life with you. We want to process what's going on in culture, process what's going on in news stories, process what's going on in politics. And we have a lot of stories to cover this year in 2024, especially about the upcoming elections. We're going to be going for it. So stay with us and we're going to be having some incredible conversations right here.